Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are joining us from. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us. Uh, my name is Sydney Yeager, and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. I'm so pleased to welcome you to today's Oh, excuse me, to today's Story Survive program centered on Yesterday Never Sleeps, how integrating life's current and past connections improves our well-being. Here at the museum, we are committed to the crucial mission of educating our diverse community about Jewish life and heritage before, during, and after the Holocaust. As part of that mission, our programs illuminate the stories of survivors, broader histories of hate and anti-Semitism, stories of resistance against injustice, and more. Thank you so much for joining us today virtually. We hope you will visit the museum in person to see our current exhibitions and also join us in October for the opening of Courage to Act Rescue in Denmark, the museum's first exhibition for visitors ages nine and up. You can learn more on our website. Uh, closed captions are available on today's program and instructions on how to turn captions on or off are posted in the chat. If you have questions for our speakers during the program, please put them in the Zoom Q&A box and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the hour. Today, we are so honored to be joined by Dr. Jacqueline Heller and Professor Judy Titer bommel schwartz Jacqueline is a physician with board certification in psychiatry and neurology and is a psychoanalyst. Over her 40 year career, she maintained a psychiatry practice and treated patients at a community clinic. Dr. Heller was an assistant clinical professor at the UCLA Department of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences within the David Geffen School of Medicine. She taught and supervised psychiatrists in training. Dr. Heller recently retired and she lives in Los Angeles with her husband. Judy is the director of the Finkler Institute of Holocaust Research, the Abraham and Adita Spiegel Family Professor in Holocaust Re Research, the Rabbi Pincus Brenner Professor in Research on the Holocaust of European Jewry, and Professor of Modern Jewish History at Bar Ilan University in Israel. She is also a historian curator of the Holocaust, What Hate Can Do. Um, you can buy Yesterday Never Sleeps at the link in the chat. Um, so thank you so much to all of you for joining us. And now I'm going to hand things over to uh, Jacqueline and Judy. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Sydney. Um, I am thrilled to be here and to be talking to Jackie about her wonderful book that we're going to hear about this evening. So let's start. Jackie, what made you write the book in the first place? Well, I wasn't planning on writing a book, Judy. I was really grieving my mother who died nearly six years ago. And in the aftermath of her death, I was so shaken and so sad that, and I was always a storyteller and sort of a, a, a biographer in a sense, because I chronicled people's stories as a psychiatrist. And so I always told stories in the family about missing things that people didn't know that the younger kids didn't know. And so I started writing for the first time in my life and it, it evolved into a book. I was just encouraged that it became what it is. So that's what happened. And it did bring me great comfort and solace to write as journaling often does. I started off as a journal and then it kind of became more of what it is now. Now I'm gonna ask you in a minute what the process was like, but you mentioned telling stories as somebody who deals with the second generation quite a lot in my own research, I think, and is a member of the second generation, me too. So I think that we are storytellers. I think that sometimes we feel that we are the um, the receptacle of our parents' stories and that we have an important task to pass it on somehow to somebody. Why? Well, we're going to go into that now. So tell me about the process. What was it actually like writing this book? It was kind of it was kind of intense because it started off with the memoir. You know, I have a very good memory and I actually kept a mental diary, as you know, when I was a child. I never wrote anything down because there could be another Kristallnacht and my, my diary could be burned or it could be stolen. And I could be killed and the world would read it like Anne Frank. I had all kinds of ideas about not writing things down. Um, I think it was also an identification with my father who was poorly educated and he had a very good memory and he had to remember everything. And so the idea of like the port portability thing that you have to be ready to run any second and because you're persecuted and you just can't take a book with you because even that's too heavy when you need to take money and food. So these kinds of things went into it. So it was it was kind of an interesting process. It was very freeing and I enjoyed it, but it was it was very easy for me in a sense. I wrote very quickly because I'm trained as a psychoanalyst. So I have very good associative linkages it's very easy for me to make connections and I am and I've trained to know my unconscious well so I know how to use my dreams so in that sense the 
the explosion of connections came to me and it still does. I mean, I still think of new things that, oh my God, that's what that means too, you know? So it was kind of an interesting process and I enjoyed it. Wait, I'm going back to something that you said that you didn't elaborate on. I want you to elaborate on it because I know the story and everybody else should hear it too. When you said that as a child, you didn't write things down. What did you do? Well, I, I, would cry. I mean, I'd kind of remember things. I, I thought I always had a meta function. I always had a metacognitive ability to think about, think about what I was feeling, to think about what I was thinking. So I would often, um, you know, remember key things that happened that day. And at night before I went to sleep, I would recite them and go over them and try to consolidate those memories. And because they were normal memories and I had language and I had vision, vis I could see and, and put words to them. They remained with me. I mean, look, normal memory updates every time you retrieve it. You know, the same neurons come out, but it kind of updates to make sense and to not be boring. So, but, so that's what I did. I did that for several years. And I just remembered the other day that I stopped doing it when I got my first Instamatic camera, because then I just took pictures of things. I didn't, you know, I didn't have to memorize every detail. Well, the memorization, when you told me about that the first time, you remember what I said to you? It's Fahrenheit 451. Right. Combined with... Combined with how I escaped Hitler's ovens. Oh, totally, totally. But we're not there yet. Wait, we'll talk about the book in a second. We're still on the process. What had to happen to you before you could actually sit down and write such a book? It didn't come out of nowhere, but there's always a catalyst. That's a big question. Well, there. I mean, there are a couple things. First of all, I I had to, I had to reckon with the fact that you know I'm I've had to reckon with a conflict or kind of a very interesting dialectic that I think I think kind of promotes resilience but that's a side story um I I you know being being from persecuted parents being a product of that and as I said a moment ago you know we were always ready of ready to run and that kind of thing was embedded it just perfused our environment that was kind of like keep, be small stand or rock don't join clubs don't join organizations don't be on the census don't vote you know be invisible I that was the one that I got. Don't ever sign a petition. You don't want your name on something. Right. Be anonymous, be anomic. In fact, I didn't know how to spell my name correctly till I was in third grade. And I was mortified when my teacher told me I was spelling Jacqueline J-C-Q-U-I instead of Q-U-E. And I told her she was wrong. And then my mother told me I was right. I was so embarrassed. But so I don't think I was supposed to know my name well enough to be able to write it down. Um, so um, um, what was I saying? Yeah, um, the so so what had to happen before you could write it down what had to happen was i had to so that that's one that's one aspect of the conflict and the other end is well i have to how do i i'm the first american in my family i'm the hope of the future how do i redeem my parents survival guilt how do i make them feel like they lived for a reason and everyone else was murdered and that means you have to win a Nobel Prize. You have to be a famous doctor. You have to be a famous professor like you are, you know, and you have to do something useful. You have to do something magnanimous in the world, which my mother did. So that was another tough act to follow. So being between those two, which is why I'm nervous today, because I'm not, not, I'm more used to being under a rock. You know, it's, it's that, that was a tension I had to deal with. So I, when I was writing, I thought, well, this isn't going to be a good book. No one's going to read this, but what if it is good? What if someone reads it? So that's, I had to deal with that. That, that's the first thing that was the main hurdle. The second thing was, um, how do you, how do I write about my family candidly without betraying, betraying them? How do I write about what really happened in an organic way and still be protective? And I realized that wasn't, just didn't turn out to be very hard because I have a very balanced and loving feeling toward both my parents. And I never really blamed them for anything because I always, I I'm an empathetic enough person where I understood their circumstances and they yeah. were smart enough to tell What's that? Even when you were younger? Well, when I was, the good thing is they were very, they, my parent, my, my father especially was very good about saying, I'm nuts. This has nothing to do with you. You know, so he would look at me when I was little, he'd look at me and he'd hug me and then he'd start crying. And I'd say, what did I do? And he'd say, nothing. It's just unbelievable. You look like my, it's exactly like my sister, my, my, my sister did. And she's dead. And that's, I said, that's awful. Only two years ago, did I find out when I was still writing uh, that that he saw this sister of his who who was really who was really the one who became motherly to him after his father died, that she um that she he saw her be beheaded in in the town square and and you know I'm sure he had flashbacks and he was seeing that when he'd look at me but he he was nice enough not to tell me that my sister told me that oh that was nice of her to tell you sure 
well, it's okay now. I mean, I, I recovered from that, but I, it really, it really endeared me to him even more to know that he, he was very protective in certain ways. He you did his best. Things, you think there are things that's better that we don't know even now? Do you think there are things that we don't know? Of course. No, it's better that we don't know even now. Not, not necessarily, not necessarily. I don't think so because the things we don't know, we know anyway, because the feelings there, the intensity of the emotion was there, even if the words weren't, whether there was intense emotion or there was none at all. You knew something was wrong. There was something terribly wrong with the ethos, you know, with the, with the, with the, with the atmosphere, you know, it was, it was just in the air and it was pervasive. So even when things seemed normal, there was this undercurrent of angst and terror and, and things weren't normal anyway. We, might, we did weird things, you know, nothing terrible. I mean, my parents loved me, but, and they were, that makes a big difference, you know, that they, there was a lot of love in the family. So when there's a lot of love mixed with these hidden traumas, it's, it's very strange. Oh, as you normal, crazy Holocaust survivors. And we, as their children were just normal, crazy second generation. There's nothing strange about that. That's textbook. Stable, in, stable and stability. Totally. Okay. So before we started this webinar, you said to me, I'm so nervous. And I said, I'm going to make you feel calm because it's just a conversation between us. So now I'm going to make you feel nervously calm because I'm going to throw a question at you that wasn't on the list of things that we just Oh, no. oh yeah. Oh, it's going to make it so much more interesting. Jackie, do you think you could have written this book if your parents were alive? Absolutely. In fact, my mother, my mother and I had a very open relationship. I mean, okay. I think about some of the things we talked about, you'd be, you wouldn't believe it. You'd, you don't want to know what we talked about. Tell we me. Talked. My mother was very, my mother was avant-garde. She was interested in pop culture. She was, she was, had her pulse on, on life as it was being lived by every generation. And she was very cool in that way. Um, of course I could have written it. In fact, I wish my, my mother would, my mother always said, you should write a book, Jackie. Should, she loved the way I wrote. And I, and of course she loved the way I wrote because I, whatever she read was lauding her. I introduced her to so many dinners and 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 in fact, in fact, in 2013, I I wrote I wrote I wrote for her I wrote a, a piece about her to for the dinner of the Museum Jewish the Museum of Jewish Heritage annual dinner. She was the honoree, and I mean there were a thousand people there, and I wrote this to her tribute to her, and she was so so amazed by it. She she asked that I read it, she asked that I read it at her funeral that included my eulogy, which was so touching, but and I did. I did, in fact. So, you know, she always said, you got to write. I said, I have nothing to say. She said, you will, you will write a book. Right? So she would be very proud of me. And my father would also be very proud. He would, my father would, my father would say, okay, you proved you're smart. You proved you're a doctor. Now, you know, when I got finished medical school and I was, a, I was an intern, he came, I came, I came in, I looked ha haggard and had you know, dark circles under my eyes. He said, Mom, Lechayla, you proved already. You can do it. You're a doctor. Go get married, have babies, you know? So he'd probably say the same thing. Okay, you wrote the book. It's fine. It's beautiful. I'm proud of you. It's wonderful. Relax, relax, take it easy. So he'd be very proud though, too. It would not have been a problem. Okay, it's fascinating that I'm asking you how you felt about writing the book vis-a-vis -vis doing it when your parents aren't here, but your answer has to do with how your parents would have responded to the book. I'm asking about you. Would you have had the openness to write the things that you did if they were sitting and looking over your shoulder at every word that you were writing. Yes, yes. my father would have been totally fine with it. Um, I mean, there's nothing. There's nothing to be ashamed about. I, I certainly oh. don't. Say, and and I think my mother might might have understood some things. I, I might have been able to teach her a few things. There were a few things that were a little off base, that were off limits. A few things about you know who killed her father and that sort of thing. Um, she was very touchy about that because we create our story. Our story is is what we think the facts are, but our narrative is the way we annotate it, the way we amend it for the circumstances. She needed. As Joan Didion says, "We tell stories to live." She had her story which probably was based in some truth and some reality. She wasn't psychotic. She was a normal person. She was a full-fledged adult when she was incarcerated. I mean, full-fledged. She was her, she had her character by the time she was 17. And she and she had a story that probably had a, a basis of reality, but some of it was manufactured to survive. She had to survive and get through. So she 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 told she's kept herself busy by reciting novels in her head when she was underground. And she had to, she couldn't, she couldn't fathom. That that her father was had, might have had a senseless death that he was just murdered randomly. She couldn't think of that. She saved her family. You know, she she was given over to this Ukrainian militiaman who basically helped hide them for two and a half years. 
and to think that he was her father was senselessly killed and when she when she sacrificed herself it's just it didn't work for her so um so and i didn't want to i didn't want to damage that and i didn't want to damage that in a way that would make her feel badly when she was alive but i would have still written it she knew how i felt she knew what i thought back then okay okay that's good then then let's get back to the book and I mean, that was the only kind of argument we ever had was over conceptual things like this. It would have been interesting to see what she would have said, hearing about what she. But if the story worked for her, then it worked. And it would have been very interesting to hear what her brother said a few days after she died. He said something he'd never spoken to anyone about in seventy-five years, or maybe even more. He was eighty-five at the time that she died, and he yeah. said to me, "We were saved not because of mommy. We were saved because of me." He said to me. I said, really, Arthur, I've never heard this story in my life. He said, no one's ever heard the story. But the truth is we were saved because of me, because Sitter, the farmer who hid them, uh, didn't have a son. He was sorry he had a daughter, apparently, according to Arthur, who was eight years old. And he took me out of the hole twice a week. I rolled his cigarettes perfectly and he told me stories and he fed me. That's why, that's why we're alive. And I said, really, Arthur, I didn't know that. And I actually tried to confirm that because, you know, I spoke with the family after my mother died. I, I had a long FaceTime with them and I hadn't seen them since my, since the Yad Vashem, um, since her, Yerka's father, Siddur was, um, became one of the righteous among the nations at Yad Vashem in 97. I hadn't seen them, but he, we recognized each other immediately. And I, I asked them, did he come out? Did, and she said, she doesn't remember. She was a little girl, but, she, but her father did smoke cigarettes indeed. So, you know. That was his story. He's alive. Doesn't that's, matter. Does it matter if it happened or not? Well, as a historian, we're used to that. That's Rashomon. That's something that happens to a bunch Well, but of Rashomon's about a murder. This is no one. No one necessarily got hurt with Arthur's story. You know what I mean? It's not well, like not with the story, but the whole thing is about the Holocaust, which is one big murder. I know, I know, but I'm seeing in micro way as far as Arthur's life, it's not damaging to anyone for him to have that fantasy or if it's true or not, it helped him. That helped him cope before, during, and after. Doesn't everybody's story help them cope? Absolutely. No. That's why we update, that's why we update the narrative. That's why we have to update our parents' story, not not refabricate it, tell it as it was, but say, I think this may have also been possible, or for me, this part of it's the most important thing. And what does that have to do with the title that you chose for your book? It has to, well, well, yesterday never sleeps. I mean, initially it was finding Rosebud, but that was too gimmicky. But I, I like yesterday never sleeps because it really talks to the unconscious, which, you know, our, our, our unconscious mind drives 95% of our behavior and our actions. We don't realize it. We think, and this has to do with, you know, what, what's the most important point in the book. I think that might be it, that we're all unconscious beings. We we're too arrogant. We're too we're too confident, we're too assertive, we have too much hubris about, about our human nature, about our nature. And we have to recognize we don't have to know what the, what we're doing. And that's, that's very acceptable because we have to defend ourselves from mental and emotional and physical pain. We have to have barriers. We have to have ways that we don't have to remember terrible things or think of terrible things. So we, we, we're self-deceptive. I mean, we tell ourselves lies and we're self-deceptive. We're masters at it. And that's, and that's something we need to know. We need to be able to sidle up to our unconscious, get to know it better so we can manage the things that are very difficult and that cause us a lot of trouble. They're the things that erupt forward and cause us to do impulsive things, triggers that set us off and we scream and yell or cry or whatever it is and do damage to people. Or we, we blame, you know, we blame other people for how we feel. Is that your message? So well, I mean, as far as, far as the, the title, the title is about the timelessness of the unconscious. It's past, present, and future. It never goes away. And if there's a problem with something that you've repressed, it'll it'll remind you. So you really don't know. You don't need to go digging in the past. The past will find you if it's important. But it's about it's about the omni the omnipresence, the timelessness of the unconscious, and the way the way it can take hold of us, which is I, I mean, it's there for a purpose, but. The way we need to help help manage it, not control it. It's not an evil thing, but it's it's a big part of our of our of our mind. So wait, what is the book actually about? Is it about Holocaust? Is it about human beings in general? Is it about trauma? You said before that it's not just a book about trauma. What is it a book about? How would it's, you? It's funny. It's very parts of the book. One of my one of my closest friends was read it read it in one of its earliest forms in one of its earliest copies like two years ago I actually four maybe three years ago and she said I really love it but what's it about like I don't get it you know I 
what's so it about? Like what is it about? Well, I think the thing is, I think what is, I mean, I think the reason why people are liking it so much and I'm getting such good reviews is that it resonates somehow with it, with a lot of people. There's something about whatever it is that people, that, that, that moves people or that speaks to them. And I think it's about, it's about, a, it's about how to get to know yourself better so that you can have more control over your intense emotions. Because this is about a, a, the, the raw emotion, the amygdala in the brain emotion that doesn't get processed or where traumatic memory gets laid down and the things that we can't get over that come up and haunt us. And in the case of a child of Holocaust survivors, it's not, it's not so much a haunting that makes me explode or makes us do irrational things. It's a, it's a fear and a terror. And for me, kind of an anxiety that drives most things that, that we do. And there's also the the sense that you know well so that's that's one thing um so it, it's about it's about how to get to know yourself better how to not be self-deceptive because if we lie to ourselves then there's no, what do we do with history in a sense i'm going to ask you that question if we're not honest with ourselves how, how can we know what we're doing and what happens too much is that people don't look in their heart and they don't look in their head they don't know what they feel I mean, 10% of the population can't define, they can't define their emotions. Are you happy? I don't know. Are you sad? I don't know. How do you feel? I don't know. So they can't even define the emotion, let alone define the feeling. How, what, how do they think about the, how they feel? What do you think about how you, your emotion? That's that's what's called a feeling. And when you put feelings together, you get into a mood, you know? So most people can't even tell you what those things are. They're just reactive. And so, you know, you think of think of a person like road rage, think of someone who flips you off because you you barely cut them off by accident. They start screaming at you and they flip their finger at you. I mean, that's not about you. That can't be. You didn't do anything. And it's obvious you barely you try you veering into their lane and then you see them and you move out and they still flip you off because they th they say she's trying to humiliate me. She's trying to show me up. I'll show her. And they start a race with you and you realize they're they're off the wall. You realize that they're dealing with something that has nothing to do with you. And that's how most of the world is. So, you know, and that and that that, that of course leads to social social oppression and all kinds of ultimately genocide. But we spend too much time pointing the finger at other people when we should and wagging our fingers saying you shouldn't do this you shouldn't do that instead of looking into our hearts and our minds so what are we supposed to that's do the that's the message what are we supposed to be doing what are we supposed to be doing then as, as instead of having re, reactive just reacting without when you see somebody like that it's very it's very understandable what you're saying makes a lot of sense on paper what happens when it's in reality in other words okay I've accidentally cut somebody off and I am now the victim of road rage. How am I supposed to respond to that? Are you the victim of road rage or are you the perpetrator? Because they want they become one and the same. Tell me about the victim. How does the victim of road rage understand that crazy perpetrator who's not really dealing with me, but he's dealing with somebody else? Do you you have to know you have to know yourself in order to say that. You have to know yourself in order to know that can't be about me. Like my my chapter, my second chapter in the book about Dana and her trigger. I mean, this is a story about a girl, a woman who was who who had had terrible trauma as a child. She'd seen gun violence drive-by shooting and killing of a friend of hers. And she was a, she was a salesperson in the store that I walked into. I was well-dressed. I'm middle-aged. I was half her. She was very tall and much larger than I am. I'm clearly 40 years older than she is. She saw me with my grandchild in hand and she thought the key in my pocket was a gun. And she called the police on me when I left the store. So, you know, that, that, what do you do with that? You, you, you freak out the way I did. I was like, this is impossible. I'm six, I'm surrounded by six police officers an hour later. Um, Cause I actually, she fled the store and I, and I kept watch over the store. So no one would rob them. And 45 minutes later, I left, I went across the street and I said, I'll come back, go back to the car. This, my grandson was with, with a friend that was with us and he was asleep anyway. And I went back and I see a bunch of people milling about the store and I walk in, I said, so I knew something happened here. And the officer said, were you in the fitting room 30, 45 minutes ago? I said, yes, I was. And they said, what is, and they said, what is that in your pocket? And I just went to reflexively reach into my, and they, 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 bought, they holstered their gun. No, no. It, Yes. Yeah, so like I was, you know, I was, I was traumatized. I really was. And I realized at the end of this whole saga that she made me feel as scared as she did. 
That's called projective identification. She made me a scare. She turned me into the victim that she was at the time. And she, you know, so victims become perpetrators. So if you don't know that, you can't stop yourself and rationally say, look, she's a middle-aged woman. She's, it seems like a nice lady. She's with a grandchild. Of course it can't be a gun. What else could it be? Could it be a key? Could it be, could it be a, could it be a, a leather wallet? You know, what, what else could it be? But she automatically went to a gun, a, a gun, which made no sense. It was a little, one of these keyless lock things that had a little leather thing on it. And it, was, and it had a little slit pocket. It was very strange. So that's a bizarre, striking example. But these things happen every day in our life. And how often do you get blamed for something that you don't think you have anything to do with? So that already gives us an inkling to why do you think people will be interested in such a book? Because it's dealing with so many topics that, all of us are dealing with not only people who are children of Holocaust survivors. So, okay, well, yeah, that's correct. I mean, it's dealing with something that's kind of human and across the board human, which is that we have to, in order to, and, and again, we didn't go into this yet, but it's based on attachment theory, which, oh, which, which based, that. what's that? Tell us about it. So, I mean, it's basically based on the idea that kids with children that are born with a good enough parent one good enough nurturing parent who's consistent, who's reliable, who's dependable, who's loving, is enough for the child to have healthy attachments to people, healthy relationships. They feel security, they feel basic trust, they grow up and they have autonomy, they have agency, they have, they realize they're an independent center of initiative, they have a, they are identity forms, and they do well. So are that's there any children of Holocaust survivors like that. What's that? Are there any children of Holocaust survivors who are like that? Of course there are. Of course there are. There are some normal ones. Tell us about them. Oh, the word normal. That's on my vocabulary. Ah, okay. Unless it's Frankenstein and Mel Brooks and the Abby normal brain. But I don't use abnormal or normal that much. Because because it's because it's it's a it's a serious word in my profession, and I don't like to I don't like to bandy about serious words as if they mean something specific. So, um, I don't know what's normative for children. You'll have to tell me because I'm not an expert in children of survivors, like you are. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I've met children of survivors, people, and that's what I'm looking for. To Sorry, try to, and you're an expert in people. Which is even yeah, but I'm not expert in all people. You know, I can't prove that all children of survivors are such and such. But I mean, for the in the for the majority, I don't know all of them. The ones I know have had trouble for the most part, and, and they're not as resilient. They're not as not everything is as resilient and as and as wonderful as everyone thinks. A lot of them have problems, and so they have. Question: Can children of, of people who survived such a cataclysm? Now, this is a serious question. People yeah. who survived such a cataclysm. Everybody comes out with something wrong with them because you cannot go through something like that and come out unscathed. How does that translate afterwards into being a parent and giving your child the security that a child needs? Even if a parent verbally will give a child security, as soon as that kid realizes, hey, I don't have grandparents and I'm named after them and I don't like your story about your aunt, being beheaded. So you didn't have to know all the details, but you knew that she was gone. Just being brought up in a family where a nice, loving, wonderful family, and then along came Adolf Hitler and shoop, the generation. How much time do you have, Judy? That's a really long question. I'm supposed to keep it under uh, two minutes. Can't do it with that. <laughs> I'm keeping it. So I'm, what I'm trying to say, in one sentence, in one sentence. For people who have gone through such a cataclysm and that cataclysm, at least its basics, are known to their children, is it okay. possible for them it to would, give children uh, security? It would have been possible for my mother had she had she had me 30 years later. In other words, there's, there's something called post-traumatic recovery. People do get better. People do feel better. They cr go on with their lives and the traumatic memories are, it depends on how traumatic they are, but memory can be packaged and it can, and it can be dulled and the, pa the pain can be dulled rather. The memories don't change if they're traumatic, but they can be, they can, the pain of them can be dulled. The emotionality can be dulled. And that's what it is with all these people that think, oh, I gave my child a normal life. They had everything, they had the best of everything, but they don't realize that their emotion was 
damaging and destructive and, and promote, promote ter terror and anxiety and angst. And they also think, commonly they think, the survivors, that if they don't tell that, they don't know, they'll be fine. But they know anyway. They don't understand that there's there's a it, it, there's a filter that that, is the, that that lets everything filter through all the the chaos all the all the inchoate feelings that they have all the emotions that are that are traumatic that are fragmented all the memories that aren't clear they come through so it, it, it's possible but you know look let, let me get if you, my my family's a perfect example. My sister and I, my sister's 12 years older than me. We had different lives. We had basically we had two sets of parents, completely different sets of parents. She grew up in post-war Germany in 1947, and I grew up in New York in 1960. And we had completely different lives. She grew up in post-war Germany. That she was they were still running for their lives. They they were no nomads. They were they were poor. They she didn't have a stable life. She didn't have a stable childhood. She was still in a in a in a war-torn zone with anti-Semitism. And and it was and they lived in one room, four people, five people. So that's a different world. I grew up in a normal enclave and I went to the same school and I went to summer camps and I had a privileged life by all by all com comparisons and my parents learned a lot she was the guinea pig they made mistakes on her that they didn't make on me they made mistakes on my brother that they didn't make on me when they told him we were going to the circus and he ended up in a hospital with four point four point restraints to have his tonsils out they knew not to lie again about when they, when I'm getting my tonsils out so when I got my tonsils out two years later they said we're going to the hospital to get your tonsils out so and that could happen in any family so that that's not specific to survivors and a friend of mine said well what what makes your childhood worse than mine you you went to school you had normal things you went to to camp you had a dog you know you had parents that loved you and she's right in many ways but the, the the distinguishing thing between living with survivors is that their pain is palpable and it's ever present and it's not talked about but it gets converted into things and the emotionality is still there my father had nightmares he screamed at night like a hyena and you know he wa he walked around screaming in his sleep. It was terrorizing to all of us. And at the same time, I heard I heard kittens crying outside my window because they were just stray kittens around. I thought they were babies abandoned by their mother. I thought they were dying uh, human babies abandoned by their mother. And that's and that's because my father's mother died when he was that my that age when I was six, and he was abandoned. And so I thought, okay, that's what's happening. To why? So I asked my mother one day, mommy, why are these Babies left outside by their mothers. It's terrible. She she laughs. She goes, "They're not babies. They're just some stray kittens." And I said, "Oh, I didn't realize that." You know, so it, so that's the difference between my friend's family and my family. She's not thinking they're dying babies, you know. And then and then there are other things that go along with this. You know, when you start making these connections to create a story that makes sense to you. It's very grounding. You know, when you finish a puzzle, you finally got the last piece and you're like, oh, that's great. We're done. You feel accomplished. You feel like you've done something. And there's something rooting about that when it comes to your family history. So, you know, as I still keep in filling in the blanks, I'm like, why was that? So, why was I so weird about those cats crying? And I realized, well, at the same time, why did, why did we have this dog? We had this German shepherd dog that I was terrified of. The second they brought her home, I was three years old. We'd moved to our new house and her head was big. She could have swallowed me up with her mouth. And she was terrified. I thought, I said, Mom, Dad, why do we have a dog, the kind of dog that bit the, the Nazi dog like that bit mommy in the hip? Why do we get the same kind of black German shepherd? And they said, because he will, she will protect us. And I thought, well, that's weird. You know, so so that kind of thing. And, and, and then, of course, she wasn't spayed and she had litters of puppies and no one took care of them. So my brother and I would bury these puppies in shoe boxes in the backyard and we created this mass grave of puppies. And this is going on while my father is screaming and the stray kittens are outside. You know, so and, and there, there are more and more things all all going on at the same time. These can consolidate and create fantasies for children. And you, I was I was imaginative so I could create these stories, but it was a terror and the fright that stays with you. And, and that's 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 the difference. That's the difference between kids of trauma. To, but my mother worked a lot of it out and she got much better. My father died young, so I can't tell you where he would have gone. But my mother did much, much better. So by the time I came around, I mean, there's still a lot of problems. My mother was still, still had issues, but um, you know, I, I, it, it is possible. Anyway, not normal, but not so neurotic that you can't function, let's put it that way. Oh, it's just the opposite. I would say super functioning because so many of us had to achieve. 
Well, and yeah, that's, that's, yeah, super yeah. at what expense? To be sure. So basically what you're saying is that the children of survivors who were born shortly after the war are a very different story than those who were born a decade and a half later. And that Maybe. they that this is something that is also borne out in the, the historical studies that I have done, that the whole generation of kids who were born between 1945 and 1949, 1950, are completely different than those who were born in the late 50s and onward. And I know children of survivors, of very young survivors, who were born even in the 1980s. It is a completely different world, and yet there are some common denominators that link everyone. So, so you're saying so the ones do better? I would say that I, I hear I, I'm cautious as a historian saying better or worse. They do differently and they have to face different challenges. But the ones who were born right after the war, they had to face parents who were still very much processing the horrors that they had gone through. They yeah. had no time to process. They were still deep into those horrors. That's right. By the time they we came around in the late 50s or the early 60s, there was some processing that happened already during those 15 years that worked in our favor. But let's there, get back to the book because our time is, well, is going. Uh, sure. No, I mean, wait, more yes, I that. Say, two G's is so much more fun. <laughs> Go on. What did you uh, want to add? It's okay. I don't want to, I'll digress and it's too I'm long. Sure. It's fine. It's, we still have time. Go ahead. I was I was just going to say that, I mean, some, a big difference between my sister and me and people that, that were born later is that later on, there that a, a big part of repair and recovery is, is apology, is acknowledgement. And so the children of trauma, I think any all over the world, um, you know, that how they're doing depends a lot on the apology. Um, like the Armenian kids, fifth generation down, are not doing as well as maybe we are because they haven't. There hasn't been recognition. So once there was recognition, there was the Eichmann trial, there was Vita Gutmacher, there was fiscal restitution. There were books being written about the Holocaust survivors, not about the children until Helen Epstein in 1979. So we were we were we were old already by the time we started talking about what was going on with us. But our parent, my parents, by the time I I was at, at 10 years old, there was stuff happening that recognized this happened happened and that's a big that's a big relief so i just wanted to add that, that that's another thing that makes a difference in my experience that is very very important okay i want to get back to the book for a couple of minutes you well this to, is the book. i am the book you that is and that is Fahrenheit 451 over and over again we are the living books that we write if you had to start writing this book over again now from scratch what would you do differently um, I'd probably thank all the people that helped me in red and I didn't have time to do it properly in the acknowledgements because there was a deadline. I didn't get to thank all my friends. Um, otherwise, I don't know what I would do differently. I'm actually kind of very, I'm kind of happy with the product. I, I mean, I don't know if it was Tolstoy, but someone said, you know, libraries are full of unfinished works because I could never finish it. Um, but I'd probably get, I'd probably get some help with it actually. I really, I mean, I read books and I read books that have clinical stuff in it and have neuroscience in it. And they all had all these people helping them, you know, reading it and telling them if they were right or wrong. At the end, I was like, I have to hand this in. I'm like biting my nails. I'm like, shoot, I should really get like a neuroscientist or make sure I'm right and make mistakes. So I, I would have done more I did because I wasn't planning on it to become like a real book that had academic stuff in it. And, and before I knew it, I had 400 references and they said, you can't publish these. It takes up 40 pages. So I didn't really know what I was doing. It was just an organic process. I'd, I guess I'd be more structured about it, but it evolved, you know, de, it just evolved de, no, de novo. It was just what it was. So I would be more, more, more mindful about organizing it. What was the hardest thing about writing it? What's that? What was the hardest part about writing it? I cried a lot. <laughs> And and I kept and I kept revising because I kept having new connections. And I tried to point out, I actually was I was asterisking all the places in the book where I'd have a new, you know, a new, 
epiphany or a new discovery about, oh my God, this is what this, this is how this happened. It's very striking in the dream chapter because I had a dream that haunted me for 50 years back to the unconscious. It follows you around. Even if it's just annoying sensation, it follows you around the way love follows you around, the way if you're love struck or the way I feel my children are always in mind. They're always at the back of my mind. They're always there within me. And that's what that's what's that's what's good. That's what happens with relationships, with good ones and with bad ones. The bad ones torment you and you hear them yelling at you in your head and the good ones make you feel good you know okay that that makes a lot of sense um what makes the book special what makes it a special very different than any second generation memoir that exists well i don't know because again i haven't read every second generation memoir some that to some that a, a negative example that I really don't like are the ones where they blame the parent for their terrible behavior and they blame it on the Holocaust, which I think is a, is a, is a poor use of the Holocaust because you, you know as well as I do that a Holocaust, if someone's 15 or 17 or 18 years old and they're incarcerated, they don't become a bad, evil person beating up their children. They usually don't turn into that. They usually are good, fine people who still love their children. They have mishigas and they can be nutty and they can have idiosyncrasies. So, um, but but so that that kind of bothers me when I've seen I've seen books like that, um, and I don't think that's fair to the parent or to the parent's memory. Um, I think look, I don't know what, how it's different than other books, but it's different because first, I'm a medical doctor. There aren't very there are very few memoirs, if any, written by women doctors, and and so that's one thing. Um, so I have a medical background. I do bring medicine into this. I really try to be holistic and integrative, and explain th explain the bio the physiology and the neurophysiology and the neuroimmunoendocrinology and the genetics and the epigenetics of things that go along with what we feel and what we think and the troubles that we have and how to overcome some of them. So that's different. I mean, it is a mishmash of a lot of things. And, uh, and I'm also a second generation survivor. And I feel like I have to I have to bear witness in a sense. I have to bear witness as someone who watched people who went through this and what does that do to the next generation? So in that regard, I feel like that's, that my mother was a, his, my mother was a Holocaust educator. I'm more of someone who's trying to show us what can happen to the kids if we're not, if we, and, and how we might be able to change that and how we need to update our narrative, our life narrative to meet our context without betraying our parents' memory, learning how to do that. I think that's very important. And I think we start, we need to start taking histories of the children. That is one of the first questions that you asked me. Is there a repository of interviews with second generation? And I remember that I misunderstood that question. That was a couple of years ago when we talked. And I said, lots of survivors. You said, no, I don't mean the survivors. I mean second generation. And it was the first time I ever thought about it. And I actually started one of my books with your question. Really? I didn't know that. Yes, yes, yes. You yes. members? It's not, it's not published yet. I'll send it to you. I quote you. And I said that a friend of mine asked me that. And that's what got me thinking that we have to write down. We're already at the stage where we have to write down second generation memories. And maybe that's going to be a book. Maybe we'll collaborate I on it. I think it should be a book. And I think it should be an exhibit. I mean, I think it's very important because um, we're, we're getting old too. And some of us, some of some second generations not doesn't do as well as, as their parents did because our parents survived, but the second generation in it, they identify with all kinds of things in their parents, including the, 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 the survival spirit that they had, the fact that they lived through dangerous things. And, and a lot of children that I've known of Holocaust survivors, 2Gs, they really suffer by not having a clear sense of what's dangerous and what's not. They have a warped sense and their, their perceptions are really off. And so they think it's okay to do some things that are dangerous and they've gotten killed. I mean, I, I have two in mind that were patients that got themselves murdered. Um, because they didn't, they didn't pay attention. They thought they had this insouciance that you have when you're like 12, that I, you know, I'm invincible. And they, they really got themselves in trouble and they got killed. So, you know, they're, they're more extreme behaviors. I mean, you'll read in my book, I got into something that wasn't, I didn't do it on purpose, but there was an under, there's an undertone of wanting to know what it was like to be my mother. How bad was it for her? And do I have to understand that in order to have to go through something terrible in order to really get what she did and understand her? But so, so, you know, I think, I think it's important for us to bear witness for what we witnessed. I didn't go through anything they went through. I was lucky enough to not be running for my life and be stuck in my own body being fearful. But I, I still had the experience of being fearful by osmosis, but I could observe what they were and what they were going through. And it's heartbreaking. 
but it, it makes you empathetic. You Maybe know, that's one of the strongest messages of your book that survivors have their story and the second generation, their children have their story. It's a very different story. It's a very interconnected story. Each story has its place. Each story should be told. And the third generation and the fourth generation are suffering too. And apparently, I mean, there's there's not that many studies, but there's some. You know, there's, the, the children of survivors are one of the most studied trauma group in the world, other than than Vietnam veterans and, and other you know vet, war, combat war veterans, um, which you know Rachel Yehuda does a lot of. Um, but you know, we're very we're very well studied because we're a clear and coherent group that's like identifiable, and um, and some of us. You know, some some of these second generation, I hear their parents were 100 and the kids died before the parents do or very close. You know, they don't do as well, necessarily. So well, I think there needs to be more. Our parents were survivors. Sorry? Our parents were survivors. Correct. We aren't necessarily. No, I Sur said we're, we survived the survivors. Oh, yes. I quoted that one also. Jackie sorry, wrote sorry. a marvelous book and a very, very important book. And I urge every one of you who are listening to this webinar to go out and to get that book and to read it because you won't be sorry. Everyone <laughs> has something to learn from that book. Thank you, Judy, so much. And thank you for being here with me. I really appreciate your presence. You're wonderful. It is my pleasure and privilege to be here on this discussion with you. Sydney, back to you for questions and answers. Yeah, I wanna thank you both so much for this really amazing discussion um, before we move into questions. Um, so, uh, Jackie, we have a lot of more clinical questions, so I, I hope you're ready. Um, so I'm just going to read this one as it is. There is emerging and established data demonstrating epigenetic changes in children of survivors. Can you comment on this scientific finding and the impact on the second generation and third generation along the lines of your analysis and comments? Thank you. I'm, do I have to answer the question? Like two minutes? Yeah, as long as long as you want. Yeah, I mean, look, the epigenetics, um, epigenetics is, uh, I, I'm assuming we know what epigenetics is. Do I need to go over what epigenetics is? Maybe just briefly, just- Let's put it this way. The DNA, DNA is our genetic structure. You know, it's a double helix of, mm -hmm. of proteins and it codes for everything that our body needs to do and make. DNA is very fixed. It's like the hard drive in your computer. It takes about 2 million years for your DNA to change minimum. So um, the epigenome is basically a little, they're little structures that sit on top of the DNA and they're like piano keys. You, they can be, you can push them down or you can pick them up. They can, or like a little cap, like a little hat, imagine that you can take off or put on. And the epigenome allows us to, to tell the body, to instruct it for, for emergencies or for moment to moment changes. It's like, it's like, the, it's like the software. You can, it's changeable and it's it's mutable, it's changeable and it's reversible. So if you have, let's say, a car that's about to hit you and you need to get your adrenaline and your cortisol going so that your your brain can tell your muscles to move, get out of the way quickly, your, epigen, your epigenome will basically turn on the genes that go to your hypothalamus and then go to your adrenal glands, say make cortisol, make epinephrine, make adrenaline so that we can fight and or flight and or freeze, whatever it is. So, you know, if it's a, a lion or a bear, you might stand there. I don't know what the rules are with different animals, but you know, if a car is going to hit you, you know, to run away, to get out of there as quickly as you can. So, so that, that allows for those, those hormones to be produced. And basically when the, when the, when the offending agent, the car is out of your way and you survived it, you're supposed to go back to baseline. Those cortisol levels and those adrenaline hormones, they drop and they go back to baseline and you, you take a deep breath like I'm doing now and you say, okay, that's over. Thank God your pulse, your blood pressure, everything goes back to baseline. And that's where we want to live. We want to inhabit a place of equilibrium and homeostasis. We don't want to be hyper aroused or overactivated. And we don't want to be under aroused and depressed and still and not be able to move in a situation like that. So that's what the epigenome is. And basically what, what people have found in, in children of survivors is that, and it's different actually, if you're a child of one survivor, a child of two survivors, um, whether your parents had PTSD or not. And that's the, that's the key word. It's chronic toxic stress. It's not like, oh, I'm stressed out, I had a bad day, or I lost money in the stock market. It's chronic toxic stress that keeps your cortisol levels and your, your basically the cortisol levels in a, in a hyper aroused state. And eventually 
it kind of there's it's all by feedback loops. So basically, if your if your levels are so high for too long, it basically depletes your 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 storage, your stores. And you end up with low cortisol levels. And you see this, you see low cortisol levels. And going into the markers and all that's too complicated, but you see this in children of survivors, worse in people with two 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 parents who are who are, and worse in they have to have PTSD. That's a criteria. It has to be chronic, intense stress that they live through. Um, and you see this in ch children with ACEs, with you know adverse child events. You see this in, I mean, you can you see it also in secondary trauma. You see it in people who watch the world the tower the World Trade Center towers come down over and over and over again. And you see it in, in you see it, and unfortunately, you see it in the babies of women that were in the towers, or, or you know what when they went down. If they were second or third trimester, you see the same changes in them when they're a year old in the babies. So and the transmission is kind of crazy the way it works, but it's even it even goes so far as if you're if you're female and you were you were you know tortured or had terrible trauma when you were a child. Um, that you can actually have the opum affected, and the the epigenome can change via the via the germ cell. So you know this is it's a complicated big topic, but humans can't be studied that easily. And for the most part, the vast majority of what you've heard so far is based on plant and animal studies because you need multiple generations to really see what's going on with the epigenome. So that's about what I'll say. That's about it for now. <laughs> that's long enough. No, thank you. Um, I think that's really, I, we've talked a lot about epigenetics at the museum, and I think it's something that people are really interested in knowing more about. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, that actually, that helped me understand a lot more of it. I mean, it's a free will and deterrent, you know, it's a thing, how much, how much agency do we have? How much can we change? And basically, we can make a lot of lifestyle changes that make a big difference. Mm -hmm. So there are different ways you can transmit trauma, to, the effects of trauma or tra tra trauma to your children. You can do it directly by the way you treat them. You can do it, it can go through their DNA, through the epigenome. It can go through the germ cell. It actually can go transuterine in birth, mm -hmm. the high cortisol levels of the mother's high so there are different ways but what i deal with and what i can deal with is the the person to person you know the direct effect mm -hmm. you know thank so you. I, I was probably born with very with very low cortisol levels mm -hmm. I probably, probably born with high high cortisol levels then they got low Mm -hmm. And 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 actually, your birth the 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 amount of trauma you have in your lifetime is called the trauma load. With each additional event, it consolidates and it makes it makes it harder to get over. For the okay. children, for the children. Okay, thank you for that, um, and thank you for that additional information as well. Um, so I'm also going to read this one just as it came in, but I might also um, broaden it out a bit. So. I'm experiencing a lot of issues with my 94-year-old survivor mom who led a pretty functional, more or less life until the, quote, third act when she fell apart um, and has destroyed all support systems I put in place for her aging process, which may result in her being placed in a home despite all my efforts to the contrary. Um, she has been diagnosed uh, with dementia, so I'm not sure how much is understood. In short, how common is it for, I'm going to assume, survivors to um have dysfunction uh or degrade later in life i really don't know the statistics on what percentage of survivors be have you know and even to what kind of dementia i mean there are multiple kinds of dementia she's talking about alzheimer's which is gen it can has a genetic component the apo4 protein or if it's idiopathic alzheimer's or if it's multi-infarct dementia or pick's disease there's a hundred different kinds of dementias so that's a variable i can't answer and also as far as her life circumstances i it's, it's that's a tough one to answer i don't know of any studies that that show that holocaust survivors do worse except for one that came out in israel that's that showed that they lived longer than the average israeli but they had more illnesses um, when they were, but these are octan non nonagenarians. These are pretty old people who, you know, by all standards across the world, have outlived their exp life expectation, you know, internationally. So, I really can't specifically say about about your mother. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't address it any further. Well, thank you for um, for giving what you could, and I know that these are very clinically based questions. So, uh, appreciate the 
uh, you. I, mean, I, would, I would advise her. I'm sure you know she need you should need to have her evaluated for what kind of dementia she has, and if there are any other underlying illnesses or concomitant illnesses, you know comorbidities. Usually, someone at her age would have other illnesses, so she should be properly diagnosed before she gets put into home. I'm sure she's had a full workup, but if not, she should see a neurologist and a dementia specialist. Um, and uh, and then, you know, as far as what's unworked out in her life, it's very hard to do with someone who's not, who's cognitively impaired. Um, I, I wouldn't know that what would be indicated except for medication and, and comforting her. And, you know, if she's, a, if she's aggressive or agitated to treat the symptoms directly. Thank you. Um, so then this is another question that came in. Is there data to establish that in addition to the differential aspects pertinent to child of Holocaust survivors born up to 1950, and those born a decade or more later, that they may also have different risk stratification for health disorders, including psychiatric illness. Judy, do you know the answer here? Oh, I've, I've dealt with the historical. I have definitely not dealt with the medical. Another, so. another complex question. Yeah. Um, born after 1950, I don't know that there's really, I don't, I've looked at, there's not great data. I mean, there's some evidence that maybe they, there's, there's more anxiety disorders and more depressive disorders. Um, but it's not 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 that clear. There's not that clear. There's some. I mean, there's one one recent article that came out maybe a few months ago um, that that indicated that there may be some concordance between neurological disorders, degenerative neurological disorders like Alzheimer's, MS, Parkinson's, those kinds of things in children's mm -hmm. lives. But there's nothing hard and fast. I mean, the best studies about about dynastic issues are all retrospective. The best studies out there are generational studies that were started a long time ago, like the Dutch famine um, in 1944, or you know that kind of thing, or the civil the civil the civil war study that came out of UCLA a few years ago. But that's those are big stories. I could tell you about the Dutch hunger, the Dutch famine, where basically you know the Nazis cut off um, the the routes to Amsterdam, and the winter of I think it was the winter of 1944. There was basically no food, and there was a famine, and it's otherwise well you know reasonably fed city and they studied after all that they there was a, a retrospective st a study that start perspective study that started with the children of women who were pregnant uh, during that famine and and hungry and how their kids turned out and they were followed by columbia university and by other universities and 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 some, some in holland and there's a multi uh multi center study that went on and this, there's statistics um, data published even just a few years ago about how they did. And basically the children and the grandchildren, children, they were clearly studied. They did worse across all, every, every, every parameter in life. They basically were, because uh, the mothers were starving. They basically had low birth weight. They grew up to be, to have metabolic syndrome, hypercholesterolemia, obesity, early death, and more hospitalizations, worse jobs, worse social life. And, and no one knows exactly why that is, but there are lot, there's lots and lots of data on these kinds of studies. And basically they were disadvantaged. The mother was starving, which put the kids into kind of an epigenetic thing of hang on to every calorie, make every calorie work for you, like in a hibernation mode. And, and they just, they struggled. They struggled across their lives with these epigenetic, um, probably epigenetic changes. So the, those, those studies are the ones you can look at and see outcome measures of how kids do. And you see with ACEs in America, I mean, the, the adverse child events, these are, these are serious, these are cataclysmic things that happen. These kids that are exposed to terrible things, they, they, all, have, they all have cortisol impairment. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that answers the question, but that's the best I could do. I'm, I'm going to say it probably does. I think it. Uh, yeah, genetics is it's a sexy word, but basically mm -hmm. genetics is genetics, and it's something that we've known about for since since Gregor Mendel. And but it's it's not everything, you know. It's just the way we can cope and the way it's it, it, it's a measure of control we have, so people like it because we can affect the epigenome by the by, by the, the way we behave, the things we eat, the things we do, the things we expose ourselves to. You want to get PTSD? Go watch your local news every night. I want to listen to every murder, every horror story, every 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 robbery. I watch all that stuff on TV, and you can give yourself PTSD if you're if you're wired for that, you know. Well, I want to, before we end, I do want to give either of you the chance, if you want to say anything else before we leave. Um, 
I have a few more hours. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's so much to still be said. But I want to say, leave us with a hopeful message. I'm sorry. Leave us yes. with a hopeful message. Well, I, I hope this was hopeful all along, but I basically look, and there's so much about the book that I didn't go into. Um, I mean, the, the one message is really, we can look into ourselves and we can do a lot to make ourselves easily and, and this is this is in the worst of circumstances. I'm sure most people with this is I'm talking about ordinary people like you and me who've had love in their life and who are not terribly abandoned, who are, don't have catastrophic cataclysmic situations, um, but ordinary people who, who struggle with feelings they can't manage. And basically, it's, we, there's a lot we can do uh, to become better people, kinder human beings. And we, it starts with being learning how to go inward and deal with our emotions, understand what they're about, and connect with them. And there are ways you can do it on your own. And of course, therapy always helps. It's not required for most people. Um, and and basically, you know, you can you can turn things around. Um, as Viktor Frankl said, you know, tragic optimism. And my mother was a perfect example. She was a great role model. She did not compete to despair. I mean, you can, if you can, you can, you can turn it around. You can do good for other people doing good for other people. I think if you ask Holocaust survivors, Judy, correct me if I'm wrong. If you look, if you ask Holocaust survivors, the ones that really triumphed, like their spirit was triumphant and they didn't despair. They'll tell you that the best thing they could do was give back to others to not despair and to move on and not focus on themselves and to give back to the world and that's how they that's how they got over that's how they they recovered in whatever way they could and that that really gave them some recovery wouldn't you say totally, totally. and that's and that's what i well, that's what i would say to people now and i and i would say the holocaust has to be has to be taught in context with children and young people nowadays i mean a lot of people you know under 50 don't know what the holocaust was and of course it needs to be taught, right? But it also needs to be relevant to them so they don't tune out. Thank so. You. All right. Well, thank know. you both so much. Yeah, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I don't know if that's hopeful, but um, that's what I have to say. A friend of mine once asked me recently, she said, how did you turn out so normal with these crazy? Cra and I said, it's, first of all, people are, we're, people are resilient, but I'm, I'm not so normal. But if you consider me normal, the truth is I had my parents loved me. They loved me and they were smart enough. They, they, had, they were reflective enough, even when they were traumatized to say, this is not about you. This is about me. And we have to be able to do that. We have to be able to do that. And that's learnable. That's teachable. Well, thank you both so much for this really amazing presentation and, and this really amazing discussion. Um, I, we're already getting kudos in the chat. So I really want to thank you both for taking the time to be here uh, with us. So, um, and I want to also thank everybody who joined us today uh, for joining us. Um, and if you enjoyed today's program, we hope you'll make a donation to support the museum at mjhnyc.org slash support. And also join us for our upcoming programs, which you can find at mjhnyc.org slash current events.